um, if you actually open the book, the first line of the book is who is John Galt, and John Galt has come to symbolize uh, in the book entrepreneurship, if you will, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, and that's sort of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, there is a, a term now going around uh, the U.S. Uh, some of you have computers, you can Google it if you want. Uh, it's called Going Gold, and uh, uh, refers to, um, well, the basic plot of this book is entrepreneurs going on strike. Uh, hence the title, Atlas Shrugged, where Atlas, as you might know, is the one who carries the burden of the world on his shoulders, and uh, basically Ayn Rand got the idea, well, what if Atlas just shrugged and just got rid of that burden entirely, uh, tossed off the burden that has been placed on him? Well, the book is itself about <laughs> entrepreneurs, in a sense, dropping out of society, and then what happens to society when they do drop out. That's really the, the theme of the book. I haven't given too much away in saying that about the plot. And so there has been, uh, recently in the U.S., the phrase has come, uh, come up, uh, going gold, uh, which uh, has come to mean, uh, in light of uh, expected increases in taxes and other things, people actually stopping work uh, to uh, keep themselves under the new higher tax rates, uh, rather than to uh, work, continue to work and pay those taxes. So uh, it's actually, uh, uh, the book is, if you ever read the book, you'll, you'll see that throughout the question is, well, who is John Galt? And it actually doesn't really get answered until you're about three quarters of the way through the book. I don't think Rand could ever have expected that uh, the phrase in some ways would, would come up in, in uh, U.S. society in almost the same way, you know, going gold. What I want to do is um, sort of talk about entrepreneurship uh, from two dimensions, uh, what I'm calling the political and the moral. Um, the first part of these, I guess, is pretty much a summary of things we've talked about the last couple days. Um, the second part of it, the moral, um, I think actually, uh, Tom and I actually have never talked about our talks, but I think it builds uh, fairly well on some of the things that Tom was uh, talking about, especially with respect to, uh, to personal identity and culture a bit. So we'll see how it goes, and then uh, we can, we can uh, ask questions uh, at the end as we go along. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to start with the political and talk about some of the ideas that we have talked about already um, and maybe um, uh, say a few more things about them that uh, maybe have not come up. Um, this is a quote from uh, the essay that actually was passed out to you that you have in front of you, uh, Matt Wrights and the Nature of Government, I think were the two that you were given. Um, and this is Rand's, uh, Rand's discussion of what rights are. She says that rights are a moral concept, the concept that provides a logical transition from the principles guiding an individual's actions to the principles guiding his relationship with others, the concept that preserves and protects individual morality in a social context, the link between the moral code of a man and the legal code of society. So the language of sort of classical liberalism, free market thought has been rights uh, historically. And what she's suggesting in this passage about what rights are is that somehow rights govern the relationship that we have between each other. That seems clear enough, okay? But a law protects the individual morality as it, as it relates to other people. That's what rights are supposed to do. And in one sense, I'm going to try to develop that theme just a little bit as we go on here. Um, We've mentioned the purpose of the state. Um, uh, Tom uh, has uh, preferred to use the term justice rather than rights. I have no, uh, no problem with that. I'm going to stick with, uh, with the term rights. But in, in a sense, justice is the protection of rights, or rights protection is a form of justice, if you will. So basically what I'm saying here is the purpose of the state is to secure the basic negative moral right to liberty. Okay, uh, This word negative seems to get uh, people, um, you know, worried a bit. Uh, it sounds, what, negative, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it's not. It's meant to really term, uh, be a term that suggests that we have uh, obligations of forbearance against each other, as opposed to claims upon each other in terms of what you have to give me or I have to give you. 
and so the negative has, has come in. Um, well, I'll say more about basic in a second, I think. Um, we're involved, as we talked about, self-direction. Uh, what does that mean socially? Uh, well, self-direction socially means that I deal with you on the basis of consent and you deal with me on the basis of consent, okay? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that every action I take uh, is, you know, fully formed and rational. It means, however, that when I deal with you, um, I'm assuming and uh, treat you as a self-directed being, uh, that is, uh, you are, in some sense, responsible and in charge of your own life and vice versa. You might make a mistake uh, in dealing with me on the basis of consent from your own point of view. I don't know that, but socially, I treat you uh, as everybody else uh, as being self-directed. Rights are going to have something to do with self-direction. This is really what I want to say in a second. Okay? Physical force is the most common threat to self-directedness. At the individual level, they'd be called criminals. Uh, socially, uh, perhaps the government is one of the <coughs> chief instruments of the use of physical force against one's own self-directedness. That is, somebody else wants to direct you in another other direction. Negative rights of liberty uh, prohibits all forms of non-consensual use or direction of persons. That's what we've been essentially talking about. Relationships between each other have to be voluntary, consensual. Um, negative again, uh, just to repeat, is if I don't interfere with you, that's a kind of negative, uh, then I am respecting your rights, okay? Positive would tend to, in rights language, would tend to mean I'm doing something to you. Okay, the reason the word negative is used is that I'm leaving you alone unless we have a consensual relationship with each other. <clears throat> rights attach, uh, I must have hit it twice, but rights attaches to persons, not times or places. So uh, I have a right, whether I'm here in Malaysia or back in the United States or in some other country, when we're talking about basic rights, okay? Modern language sometimes uses the word human rights. Uh, there are reasons that I don't exactly use that word, but insofar as the word is useful, it's saying the same thing. You have a right as a human being, uh, no matter where you are, no matter where you live, no matter what era you live in, okay? It attaches to you as a person, as a human being, uh, not as a member of a culture, a member of a time, a member of a place, okay? Now, I'll just emphasize again, I'm talking about basic rights here. There are some rights you might possess in those contexts, but they are derivative. The basic right attaches to you as a person. Okay, so basically I've said that sort of rights, if you will, basic human rights have four dimensions. They're individual, that is, they attach to you as an individual person. They're basic, which means other rights are derived from them, okay? I may have a right, or you may have a right here to be, be here at the Freedom School, okay, because you were invited and so forth, but it's not a basic human right. It's not something that is derived.